The um, title of our study this evening is The Purpose of God's Eternal Teaching Ministry. I was uh, asked a question this morning regarding why do we have to have Bible class through all eternity? Uh, after all, isn't it enough to have to endure and sit through classes through all the rest of our lives on this earth until we go to heaven? I mean, is God going to uh, continue to um, make us sit through Bible classes forever? The fact of the matter is, it's true. What you're doing now is actually preparing you for an eternal occupation. Now, that's not all you're going to do, but uh, it's part of what you're going to do forever. Now, this is found in verse number 7 of chapter 2. We're going to read it, comment on it, and come back to it later on. This is where we get the concept that we will forever be in Bible class. That in the ages to come, He, uh, God the Father, as well as His two sidekicks, His Son Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, might... Uh, Show. Now, the word show is actually the word that we will look at in a little bit for teaching. God the Father, uh, as well as the other two members of the Godhead, are going to teach us forever the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Now, of course, um, the very first part of this verse tells us that it is a forever concept in the ages to come. After grace is dispensed with through the rapture, there's the law, there is the millennial kingdom, and then there is the dispensation known as the fullness of times. Chapter 1, verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one dispensation. Now, it's named the fullness of times. All things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him. Now, the principle of the gathering is an eternal principle from the angels in eternity past to Adam and Eve in the garden to the ark to the patriarch's tent to the tabernacle temple to the local church in the dispensation of grace and then to his eternal teaching ministry in the future. Now, in order to understand why we need this eternal teaching ministry, we have to go back to the book of Ezekiel. In the plan and purpose of God, in original creation, He has wanted this type of ministry. God wants a ministry of teaching. Now, I think that that is quite uh, benevolent of him. God is omniscient. He knows everything. Uh, you and I, in our <laughs> best days, uh, don't even begin to scratch the surface of all that God knows. God is anxious, though, to share and impart his knowledge with his creatures. Now, this is originally seen with the ministry of the angels. So, God has a classroom ministry. The local church actually is a place of worship, but it is also a classroom. Now what we're going to do here is get the angelic order and from that see what their purpose was originally and see why it is that we have to be in God's classroom uh, forever. Now, might I say, before we look at verse 14, Ezekiel 28, that in the dispensation of grace, the eternal classroom or eternal purpose of God in having a classroom is seen more than in any other dispensation because we replace the angels in the classroom. Now, not totally. They'll be there too, learning as well. But we're going to replace angels because of our attitude toward the classroom in the dispensation of grace. No other person or believer alive can ever say that. Abraham cannot say he's going to replace an angel. Moses cannot say he's going to replace an angel. David can't say it. All the great believers in the past, but I guarantee you, 
that you are going to replace in God's classroom a fallen angel. Now, where you are located is up to you. That depends on your own volition. You can have one of the highest ranking places of available. Because you're still alive, there's an opportunity for you to advance and advance and advance and advance. In face-to-face -face teaching, you cultivate, as we said this morning, two relationships. One with God the Holy Spirit. That, of course, is most important. But secondly, God the Holy Spirit uses a pastor teacher to inculcate the word in a face-to-face -face way. That was the original classroom situation. All right? Who's the first angel, then, that we need to see? He is called the anointed cherub. And he is found in verse number 14. Thou art, speaking to Lucifer, the anointed cherub that covereth. Now the Hebrew is this, M-I-M-S-H-A, C-H, Mimshak. What does it mean? Two things. One, to pour oil upon or anoint with oil. And the other, to appoint to power. And this is the word from which we get Mashak or Messiah. Jesus Christ was anointed, as was his forefather David. Remember, Samuel came into the house of Jesse, and there were seven brothers there, uh, David's seven oldest brothers. And he looked and said, boy, this Eliab, the eldest, he's tall, he's handsome, uh, he seems to be the best. And God says, no, uh, you need to go to the eighth brother, David. And when he found David, he poured the anointing oil upon him. Now, Jesus Christ was anointed when God the Holy Spirit came upon him. The oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. But it means to, to come upon one for the purpose of empowering to an office. He is king over all. Well, in this particular case, Lucifer was appointed to an office. He was the one that covered over all. That's what it says. You're the anointed cherub that covereth. You have all the territory. Uh, from where? Well, from verse number 13, it says, you've been in Eden, the garden of God. In verse number 14, it says, you walked up and down on the holy mountain of God. From heaven to earth. Earth was basically his headquarters, but he had all of the territory between heaven and earth. Now, what we're going to do at um, this point is simply to draw you basically... Here is heaven there, and uh, here is earth here. Heaven is his throne, earth is his footstool. Now, Lucifer was the angel that covered the territory up and down and east and west in relationship to the earth. All of this was his territory. The mountain of God was in heaven. The garden of God was on earth. And that was Lucifer's original task. Now, he was the one who was originally called to gather the angels together for their worship service and their classroom service. How do we know? Verse 13. Every precious stone was your covering. Now, that just simply shows that he was the one in authority over all. Verse 13, last part, says, The workmanship of your tablets and pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. It has to do with um, uh, a musical concept. He was beautiful outwardly. He could sing beautiful, beautifully and speak beautifully as well. He was a tremendous orator, and he was the town crier, as it were. Hear ye, hear ye, it's time for service. And uh, his melodious voice told all of the angels to gather into heaven and to worship the Lord. Okay. Now, might I say it's my own personal opinion as we're talking about bumping demons out of their original position, that this position is already taken. <laughs> I believe that the Apostle Paul has already bumped Lucifer. 
there's never been a Christian like Paul. But that doesn't mean that there's not a high-ranking place for the rest of us. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 1. In other words, what I'm telling you is, please set your sights high. Because the next angel or angelic order is seen in verse number 21. It's called a principality. And it is the Greek word arche, where it says in verse 21 that Jesus Christ was raised and set high far above all principalities. Now the significance here is that the body of Christ is over the angels in this sense, but the body of Christ as well is going to participate in the original governmental order of the angels. We're going to take over where these other angels left off, and even over the good angels who questioned the Lord. Now we've, we've studied that before in the doctrine of the angelic conflict and why even the good angels were demoted uh, during the court trial of Lucifer. The word principality there means first in rank. And we know of the so-called archangels, and that's where we get the word, arche or archangel. We have uh, uh, several listed. Gabriel was an archangel. Michael was an archangel. Evidently, Apollyon was an archangel, and so forth. But these guys are going to be demoted, and somebody in the body of Christ is going to take over where they left off. You can be one of the archangels. Now, as you see, we have... Um, uh, listed here. Basically, uh, as far as we know, there were uh, four positions of the archangels. There, are, there were probably more, but an archangel could be head over one of the four quadrants of the universe. You see, God has divvied up the universe. The Many of the sons of God, which are angels, live in planets in the universe. And uh, Lucifer would go up and down between heaven and earth, and he would go in relationship to the earth, east and west, and he had a ministry originally to all of the angels there. He was head even over the archangels at first, so that Michael originally would obey what Lucifer had to say. Okay, so it's important to understand that we're talking about government here, but we're also talking about church and learning and so forth. All right, the third one we found here in the verse. Far above all principality and power. That is the word exousia. And it means the ability to enforce. Now you might liken the principalities to a president and uh, you might liken those uh, in power, in this particular case, the ability to enforce as the judicial system, as judges. Uh, one that can, as our Supreme Court and so forth, has the highest ranking power in a nation in order to determine the rightness or wrongness of laws, and those that are just and unjust. So you have the opportunity to become one of these type of angels. And again, it just depends on how much doctrine you ac accumulate. All right, let's hurriedly go through all of these and we'll move on then. The next type of angel is a might angel. And the word might is dunamis. We have the um, word found, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Dunamis means inherent power, strength that is owned by the nature of a thing. Now, exousia has to do basically with the, with the mental aspect of power, and dunamis has to do with the physical aspect of power. 
In other words, the uh, judge does not handle the criminal himself. He turns it over to the officer of the court who has the physical strength and the sidearm, perhaps, to enforce the law. And that's what dunamis means. It means literally the enforcer, one who has inherent strength to accomplish a task in and of himself. Now, this is another possibility. And by the way, this is for men and women alike. It, it doesn't matter your size, uh, shape, or, or gender. If you accumulate that much doctrine, you have that invested in your resurrection body to take over where these other angels have left off. All right? Another type of angel. Five is a dominion angel. We find that again in verse number 21, principality, power, might, and dominion. That's the fifth ranking of angel. And dominion is this word in the Greek, kuriotes. What is a kuriotes? It is a controller. Now, as we're writing these down, I want you to understand that uh, each of these various things has to do with the quadrants of the government of the universe. Uh, for example, you can have a, an archangel here, and then you can have several of the exousia angels involved in his capital city over this uh, uh, particular quadrant. And uh, then you can have many of the dunamis angels enforcing the law uh, in the areas. And we, you have to understand that with space, there are trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of miles of light years um, out there. So we have a wide expanse of eternity. Now, uh, Star Trek and Star Wars are not all that far off by way of the reality of angelic creation there and enforcing. So uh, you might not be in quadrant one here, but you can be in quadrant two. There are lots of positions available for you if you master the Christian way of life and advance doctrinally. So a controller is one who is likened to perhaps a governor of a state. We have the, the president, we've got the Supreme Court, we've got the FBI here, the CIA with the enforcers, and now we're having the governors with the controllers. That is the curiotes. All right, let's move on. Next is name angels. It says, and every name that is named. Greek, onoma. What is an anoma? An anoma is one who is assigned a position. You can have a name or it can literally mean to give a title to. You've always wanted to be royalty. You've always wanted to know what Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles and Princess Di uh, do having their titles and so forth, title of royalty. That's what it basically an anoma is. It is the beginning of the entitlement to royalty. Royalty goes all the way from this point all the way up to the anointed cherub originally. You have to remember that Lucifer originally had not fallen and that he was originally the best angel that was ever created. And uh, it gets better as you go up and then it, uh, it uh, filters down in quality as you uh, have the the pyramid structure here. All right, there's one more type angel that we want to see. The book of Hebrews, chapter 1. And that is your commoner. The book of Hebrews, chapter 1 where it says in verse number four that Jesus Christ was made by way of his eternal position, by virtue of his being deity, better than the angels. Now this is the seventh order of the angelic order, starting from Lucifer all the way down. And the word 
angel, and when you have a double G in the Greek, it's pronounced with an N, angelos. So that's how it's actually pronounced, and we uh, more or less transliterate it into the English, angel, it's angelos. What does this mean? It means servant. And you have this in verse number 7. And of the angels he saith, who maketh, maketh his angels spirit and his ministers, or his servants, his sent ones, uh, excuse the expression, they are, they are gophers. That's what an, uh, an angelos means. He is a sent one. He is one charged with uh, the bidding of another. So a name angel can send one of these rank and file angels, the angelos, to do his bidding. And that was the way um, the, the structure of angelic life was in eternity um, past. Now, the reason for time and the reason for humanity, and especially the reason for the local church and the dispensation of grace, is so that you can uh, take over where one of the fallen angels has left off, and even the good angels, they are punished for questioning God at the original trial of Lucifer. And so therefore now you can take over, depending on your knowledge of doctrine and mastery of the, of the techniques of the Christian way of life, so that in eternity future, the, the body of Jesus Christ as the son of David will be on the earth, Israel as a nation will rule over the earth, and then all of the Gentiles who are saved in other dispensations will, will uh, live on the earth at that time. But who's going to govern the angels that are here, the good angels? That's where you come in. You as a representative of the body of Christ are going to be assigned a position in one of these uh, stations here, or maybe even in heaven itself. Because as you know, um, the throne that we represent, Paul tells us, is the one that is uh, positioned at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places. Now the ultimate is for you to be there forever. Okay, now let's go back to the book of Job chapter 38. Stay with me. The book of Job chapter 38. Now, why is there a necessity for the eternal teaching ministry? Because this is the way God originally set it up. God did not make his creatures or create his creatures with all knowledge like himself. There, by grace, God brought creatures into existence, but he brought them with limitations. Even though they were perfect, they were perfect but limited. Naturally, there is not going to be anyone like God. He's going to see to that. He said, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. He's not going to create another God. He's going to create life and life forms, but they are lower and limited, even though they were perfect. But what's he going to do? He is going to share his life with them. And that's what he wants to do with us. He wants to share his life. Now, what is his life? Jesus said that, that God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is how God exists, spirit and truth. Now, how were the angels created? They were created as flaming fire, ministering spirits, says Hebrews, and with a measure of truth. In other words, God gave all of them, in, a, in keeping with their uh, order and capacity, a measure of truth to start with. Okay, so why does he want to continue teaching ministry? Even though their capacity was set by way of their, their job, what does he want them to do? He wants them to appreciate him, love him, and praise him. That's why he continues to teach them. That's why he continues to teach us. 
Even though once we die or we have the rapture, our capacity is set, he continues to teach by way of appreciation. In other words, we cannot gain more power, closer proximity to him once we die. It's ended. But he continues to teach us because of appreciation. Verse 7. Orientation. Verse 4. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Verse number 7. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. All right. Now let's get the sons of God here. Who are the morning stars and the sons of God? Holding your place here, let's simply go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. You're holding your place in Job. Verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Morning stars, Son of the morning, sons of God. Lucifer was a son of the morning. Simply means that he, he was the first angel to be created. He was number one. All other angels followed him. Now, there's another uh, portion that maybe we should look at in the book of Revelation chapter 12. Just very quickly here. Notice verse 4. And his tail, referring to the dragon, which is the devil, as verse 9 tells us, drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Note verse 7. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. The morning stars here or the son of the morning, or the sons of God, were all angels originally. They are called sons of God. Now, they are not sons of God like Jesus Christ was a son of God, but they are considered to be sons of God. Okay? Before creation was made, God made the angels. Why? So that he could teach them something. What? His power. Come back to Job 38. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something that's absolutely fantastic here. The sons of God, the morning stars, did two things before everything was created. They sang together and they shouted for joy. All right? The word sang in the Hebrew is this. Ranon. And it literally means to harmonize. Now, actually it means this. To recite according to capacity. Now, how many orders of the angels? Six, seven? Seven orders of the angels, okay? Uh, how many does it take uh, in order to make an octave of music? Well, an octave is eight. Here is God. Now, God the Father, as well as all of the angels, were together when Jesus Christ created. Now, holding your place, let's go back to Hebrews 1. Now, 
here's what happened, to harmonize or say together or recite in keeping with one's own capacity. In other words, you have one angel that could recite uh, with, like Lucifer. Perhaps he had a real high tenor voice. Who knows? All the way down to the, to the workaholic angels, the, uh, the rank and file, just those that, are, that were angels, and perhaps they had the deeper voices and so forth. And they, they were the ones that uh, did all of the harder labor, and Lucifer was the one who had the beautiful voice. But they all had perfect, beautiful voices in keeping with their capacity, and they were to recite in keeping with their individual capacity. So we have the whole scale, a whole range, including God the Father. Now what did God the Father say? God the Father said, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye him. Verse number 5, Hebrews 1. I will be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. Verse 8. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Even therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with oil, with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now, who are the fellows? The angels. You laid in the beginning the foundation of the earth. Now, here's what they did. Verse 6, last part. Let all the angels of God worship him. God allowed Jesus Christ to create all of the angels. And we'll just uh, uh, represent them with this triangle here with Lucifer on, the, uh, Lucifer on the top and the rank and file on the bottom. Nothing else was in existence. Jesus Christ stepped out of uh, nothing and God the Father said to the angels, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye him, obey him, worship him. Let all the angels of God worship him. Why should we do this? And Jesus Christ said, let there be light. And bang, the universe came into existence. And all of the angels were, got so excited with God, said, if this is God's son, we will obey him, we'll worship him. And they, in harmony, recited in their individual capacity that Jesus Christ was Lord of all and worthy to be worshipped and obeyed. That's what it means to, to sing. But see, they had to be taught that Jesus Christ was the one. God originally instructed them in a classroom where Jesus Christ stepped out and created the universe. We'll just put it in the, in the square that we have it. And all of the angels of God rehearsed with God himself that Christ was worthy. All right? What's the second thing they did? Verse number seven. They shouted. Now, the word shout is the Hebrew ruah. And first of all, it means to break the silence. And here's an interesting concept. God wants to hear someone ascribing to him his true worth. He has to have individuals with inner capacity and vocal cords in order to break the silence. Only he existed, but he wanted someone else to appreciate him. So he had to teach them what he was. He had to show them by way of the classroom experience, and that's what it means. It means to break the silence, or it means to repeat. The one is to recite according to individual capacity. The other is to repeat according to individual capacity. Now, where do we see this? Let's go back to the garden, then we'll go back to Ephesians and we're done. Let's go to the Garden of Eden, Genesis. You see, every single one of us is different by way of our capacity, but every single one of us can learn a precept and increase our capacity. And that's, that's what is being taught here. It doesn't matter where you are in the rank and file. You can learn and you can recite the words of God. Now this was originally seen in the classroom where Jesus Christ taught Adam and Eve. The very first thing that the the serpent asked the woman is, verse 1, hath God said? What did God say? Now, she obviously was not paying attention. She didn't repeat it back as God said it. 
God said, uh, she, this is her rendition, don't eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. God didn't say that. She didn't have the capacity to recite back verbatim what God had said. That's why, verse 8, when they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day, they hid themselves from the presence represented in the voice of the Lord. Why? Because now they did not rehearse back. They didn't repeat back. And this, this is a, a, a tremendous um, boon here for learning both scripture memory verses and doctrinal concepts as a, as a pastor teacher gets, uh, gives them. One more verse we want to see before going to Ephesians, verse 17. Because you hearkened to the voice of your wife and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee. The word command there is literally to command, but it means to command or teach repetitively. Every time Jesus Christ would come down in, in the garden in the cool of the day, there'd be the, the tree of life on one side, there'd be the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He probably had a tree stump here for a podium. Here was Adam, here was Eve, and the first thing he said was, uh, you'll be allowed to eat of this tree if you don't eat of that tree. And he repeated the command. In the classroom situation, there was repetition, 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 repetition. He would come back and say, don't eat of this tree, but and you'll be allowed to eat of this tree. And then there'd be one more day given to them. Don't eat of this tree, and then you can eat of this tree. There'd be one more day given to them. And one day, they ate of this tree, and he did not allow them to eat of the tree of life again. But that's what the word shout means. They sang, literally, they recited according to their capacity, and it brought a perfect octave of harmony. There are seven orders of angels, but God the Father himself saying, this is my beloved son. And they would say, worthy is your son. And then they would repeat back, let all the angels of God worship him. That's why God has an eternal teaching ministry. Now let's go to Ephesians again, and we're through. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. Now remember that the book of Ephesians is, the, is considered the capstone of divine truth. The highest truths of grace and uh, the position of the body of Christ is given in Ephesians. It's also the book where we're told of the gift of pastor-teacher. It's also the book where we're told to be continually filled with the Spirit. Why? Because you are preparing for your eternal classroom, verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show. All right? What is the word show? In the Greek it is E-N-D-E-I-K-N-U-M. en dike numai Now, what does it mean? In simply points out within, and uh, it indicates within the instrumentality of, within the instrumentality of the classroom. So, what does dikos mean? It simply means, the I. We'll, we'll make this the, uh, the verb dikneuo. Let's do it this way. Dikneuo. Sorry about that. I'm trying to print fast here. It means to teach by pointing with the finger. So, God the Father had Jesus Christ to step out on nothing. He created the universe, and then he said, would you please look at this? This is my beloved son. He has power and capacity. He has knowledge. He is everything that I said that he was. And uh, therefore, God takes all of eternity in order to sit us down in a classroom and little by little, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, he points out what is good about himself and about his son. 
One more thing about this particular word. It is in the middle voice in the Greek, which means that God does it. He participates in bringing about the action of the verb to participate in the result. What are the results? The original results that he had with all of the angels was so that they would come to learn about him, appreciate him, and love him more and more. We can only love someone uh, as we appreciate them, and we can only appreciate them as we get to know them. And so he, even though our positions, our powers are established and set, he continues to teach us because our appreciation of him can only continue to grow and grow. So why do we need an eternal teaching ministry of God? So that he might participate in the results. The results are these, giving him back uh, glory and worship and love that are his due. That's why he continues to teach us. All right, any questions? Uh, because uh, during the Millennial Kingdom and then on forever, they too have a uh, teaching ministry of Christ, but it's with his earthly body. Uh, yeah, they have a teaching ministry there uh, with him. They will know. Uh, in the fullness of times, all things are gathered into one dispensation, but there are several segments of government in that one, and yes, they will have the classroom. I, uh, I don't think so. And the reason that I say that is that it says he will show. He will teach in the classroom by pointing with the finger. He's going to put it on the blackboard and say, you know, here's Alpha and Omega. Yeah, he's the one basically who does all the teaching as it was originally given. Lucifer's original rebellion was against the teaching ministry of Jesus Christ to the angels. He, he thought he knew it all. 